starting into lesson 2-5 today. And lesson 2-5 is the front and the back. And it's going to take us today and tomorrow. So we're going to start lesson 2-5 today and we will finish it tomorrow. Um, lesson 2-5 kind of picks up where we left off in lesson 2.4. So if you think about lesson 2.4, and the quiz you did yesterday where you had to be able to find, say, the rational zeros and then all real zeros. Well, when we get to, it'll be at the, at the back tomorrow, but we have another find zeros, except instead of saying find all real zeros, it just says find all zeros. Meaning, we're not talking just real numbers. We're also talking imaginary numbers. Okay, so we're taking it a step farther, basically, is what I'm saying here. Okay, um, a couple of just kind of review here. Fundamental theorem of algebra, you've seen this before. A polynomial function of degree n has n complex zeros, real and non-real. Some of these zeros may have a multiplicity greater than one. They might be repeated. The variation we often talk about is that a function has at most n, n zeros, right? Well, what this variation is saying is it has exactly n zeros. If you include real and non-real, so if you remember non-real numbers, the imaginary numbers, right? When we talk imaginary numbers, we'll review this today, but they're expressed in that complex form of a plus bi. And so when you include all the real and non-real zeros, it will always be exactly n, okay? So n being your highest power. We also have the linear factorization theorem. Given the fact function f of x of degree n, then f of x has precisely n linear factors. Again, some of our stuff we haven't been able to factor, but it's going to be more factorable if we start talking about non-real factors. And so that's where we're going today. Okay, key thing to point out. This one's going to be important. Complex conjugate zeros theorem. Complex conjugate zeros theorem. Given function f of x with real co coefficients, so in other words, just real numbers being in front of the variables, if a plus bi is a zero, then so is its conjugate a minus bi. So if you have a zero of the form a plus bi, then what else is? A minus bi. Do you remember what it means to be conjugate? Yeah. Yeah, the conjugate. So if it's a plus bi, you change that middle sign, basically. So the sign in front of i. Okay, so you're just changing that one sign. Sorry, I was kind of laughing as you were trying to hunt for your pencil back there. Oh, no. I knew it had to be somewhere. I could tell it must be what you're looking for, because he was digging all around. Like, where is it? Okay, so complex conjugate zeros theorem. If a plus bi is a zero, then so is a minus bi. Note that, hold on to that, we'll use that later in the lesson, okay? Oh, real quick, do you guys remember i? What is i? Okay, so specifically, i represents the imaginary unit, which is the square root of negative 1. So i is the square root of a negative 1. It allows us to have negative square roots. If i is the square root of negative 1, what is i squared? Negative 1, right? Because when you square a square root, you get whatever's under the square root. So then i squared is negative 1. Okay? Helpful information you kind of have to know to proceed in this lesson. Okay, example one gives us a function, and it asks us to write the polynomial in function in standard form, identify the zeros of the function, and the x-intercepts of the graph. So if you were counting, there's three things to do. We're going to write it in standard form. We're going to identify the zeros, and we're going to identify the x-intercepts. Okay, so let's start with example A, and let's start with the idea of standard form. 
How do I put this in standard form? Do you remember what standard form means? Highest power to lowest power. Right now it's in factored form, right? So we're going to have to foil. Foil or multiply it out. Okay, this one's a pretty basic one. Now, the, what's a little bit different here is that it's, these are imaginary or what officially we should call complex roots, but we can still FOIL just the same. So work with me here. First, x times x, x squared. Outside, x times 2i, 2ix. I usually put the x at the end still because it's still my variable. Insides, negative 2i times x. Minus 2ix. And last, minus 2i times 2i. Minus 4i squared. Are we okay with the basic foil in there? Let me zoom in. I feel like that's really small. Now, as always, we want to clean up, right? Yep, we can still. So, and notice we multiplied x minus 2i and x plus 2i. Those are what I would call conjugates. They're the same parentheses, but the middle sign is different. What happens when you multiply conjugates? Those middle terms cancel out. So, yes, 2ix minus 2ix, by all means, they're canceled out. So then f of x equals, we still have x squared, and what do you know about minus 4i squared? Plus 4, she says. Why plus 4? i squared is negative 1, so it's negative 4 times negative 1, which makes it a plus 4. So there is your standard form, f of x equals x squared plus 4. I'm going to label that right here. Okay, are we good there? Next thing we have to find are the zeros. How do we find zeros of a function? Okay, so one option is to set x squared plus 4 equal to 0. What if you back up a step? What else could you instead set it equal to 0? The parentheses. Could we do that? What? Um, actually, I'd rather you in the habit of saying the parentheses. Here's the deal. Once you get to standard form, this one, I agree, it would be pretty easy to set equal to 0. You'd be safe. However, um, once we get this one multiplied out over here, we do part B, you won't want to set it equal to zero. You'll want to go back to the factors, okay? So general rule of thumb is I would say go for the factors, which means I'm going to set x minus 2i equals to zero and x plus 2i equal to zero. So what zeros does that give me? Positive 2i and negative 2i. Because if it's x minus 2i, we add 2i. If it's x plus 2i, we subtract 2i. So those are my zeros. So you don't have to convert it. Convert it. We can't. Because it's just an i value. i is the square root of negative 1, and so it doesn't go to a whole number value. If it was i squared, I would want you to convert it, if that's what you're asking. Okay? Now, that's zeros. The last thing you're asked to find is x-intercepts. Thoughts here about x-intercepts? What? Thank you. 
Yeah. Okay. Sorry. X intercepts? Well, if we solve the f of x, guess what? You're going to get these same zeros. Can you uh, tell me where 2i is on a graph? And where negative 2i is on a graph? No, because they're imaginary, right? So what? There are none. Okay, so what do you notice about our zeros? In this particular case, both of our zeros are imaginary. If I graph this then, are these zeros going to show up? No, these zeros aren't going to show up, which means are there going to be any actual physical x-intercepts? No. And to, if you're second-guessing yourself, could you graph this right here? Think about it. What does x squared plus 4 look like? Parabola? Not over. Up. And if it's a parabola up 4, is it ever going to cross the x-axis? No. Okay. Now, could you... Put this in the calculator, x minus 2i times x plus 2i? No, at least not to my knowledge. Okay, anything I've ever tried to do with i's, it doesn't work with that. So, I am going to say here, there are no x-intercepts. And there are no x-intercepts, and I'm going to write in here, because... The zeros are imaginary. One comment I want to make before we move on here. What if we usually talked about about zeros and x-intercepts? They're the same, right? Which they are to an extent. However, up until this point, we've only talked about real zeros. Okay, so zeros are solutions to the equation. Okay? X-intercepts are also usually solutions to the equation, the thing is x-intercepts are only going to show you your real solutions. Okay? Questions on that one? Okay, let's try B. What would you say about B back there? You've got to give it a chance. And I, Now, you guys are going to figure out real quick this lesson is a little tedious, okay? And it's just, you have to be careful not to make mistakes and stuff. Because, what do we have to do on B? We want to find standard form, which means we're going to do what? Multiply it all out. Now, one recommendation I can definitely suggest here. Don't get too comfy over there, Jake. Okay, you're already struggling over there, so. No. Okay, so standard form. We have to multiply this all out, yes? Last time on part A, there were just two of them to multiply out. This time there are four. So you guys remember how to multiply these, right? Best thing is to do two of them, two of them, and then take those results. Now, one huge thing I have to tell you. When you see conjugates like these two right here, where it's x minus radical 2 times i, and x plus radical 2 times i. You need to make sure you multiply those two together. Okay, because when you multiply those conjugates, things will cancel, your eyes will drop out, it will make life a lot nicer. If you, if you try and multiply like x minus radical 2i with the x minus 3, you're going to make life a lot more difficult. Not saying impossible, it would get there, but you won't have things cancel out so much later. Okay? So, if we're multiplying those two, then the other two we should probably multiply is x minus 3 times x minus 3. Okay, let's do it. x minus 3 times x minus 3. x times x. x squared. x times minus 3. 
minus 3x. That's the inside or outsides. Then when you do the insides, minus 3x again, minus 3x, and minus 3x is minus 6x. Last, minus 3 times minus 3, plus 9. So my first parenthesis is x squared minus 6x plus 9. Okay, next ones. x times x, x squared. Then you're doing x times radical 2i, which I would say radical 2i, radical 2i times i times x. That's my outsides. What are my insides? Negative radical 2i times x. What's going to happen with a positive radical 2i times x and a negative radical 2i times x? They're going to cancel. So do I even need to write them down? Not in my opinion. Not at pre-count level. I don't feel like you have to. Algebra level, I definitely would, you know, okay, let's write them all out and then simplify. But in this case, when you see conjugates and the outsides and insides are canceling, we don't have to worry about it. And so that then just takes us to our last terms. Negative radical 2i times positive radical 2i. Okay, he says negative 2i squared. Negative 4i squared. Okay, so I'm going to do a side note. Make sure we get everybody together. There's what I'm multiplying, yes? A negative times a positive is going to make it a negative. Radical 2 times radical 2. What's the shortcut here? Radical 2 times radical 2? It's just 2, right? Now, can you say radical 4? Yes, square root of 2 times square root of 2 is square root of 4. But the square root of 4 turns around to be 2. So I prefer to just think square root of 2 times square root of 2 is 2. I times I? I squared. Clean that, simplify that one more bit before you put it in, that, in there. What is negative 2 I squared? Plus 2? Because I squared is negative 1, and negative 2 times negative 1 is positive 2, correct? So what goes in this parenthesis? x squared plus 2. Notice how the i's canceled. I multiplied two conjugates that had my imaginary values, but because they were conjugates, the i's all dropped out. Now, multiply again. Do you guys know what to do from here? Multiply everything, right? So one option is x squared in the first parenthesis times both items in the second parenthesis. Negative 6x from the first times both items in the second, and 9 times both items in the second. The other option, which is, I kind of like to do this one backwards, and I don't know why. I tend to do x squared from the second times all three in the first, and then 2 from the second times all three from the first. Second hour told me, I said, so you're doing it backwards. And I said, yeah, I guess so. The key is when you mul end up multiplying these, you should have, what, six terms? So... I'm going to say six before you simplify. Yep. Oh. I haven't simplified yet. Okay, so I'm going to say this x squared times each of the three terms in the first. So x, x squared times x squared, x to the fourth. x squared times minus 6x, minus 6x cubed. x squared times 9, plus 9x squared. And then we take the 2 and do the same thing. 2 times x squared plus 2x squared. 2 times minus 6x minus 12x. And 2 times 9 plus 18. And then I've got one last cleanup step. x to the fourth minus 6x cubed. plus 11x squared, minus 12x, plus 18. Does yours agree? 
And this is our standard form. Mechanical or a mechanical? Are you struggling with that? No, I didn't. <laughs> Let me know if that one has issues. Okay. Yeah. okay. Uh, what's next? Zeros? What are you going to do about zeros? Uh, Set each of the factors equal to zero. And this is the example, you know. Keaton, you wanted to use the last equation and solve that. That's fine on that one. This one, yeah, I'm not setting that equal to zero. I'm going to set each of my factors equal to zero. So x minus 3 equals zero. x minus 3 equals zero. Yes, x minus radical 2i equals zero. And x plus radical, whoops, radical 2i equals zero. Um, the question in class, could you just do the x minus 3 once? Yes. I just did it to make a point that officially it's setting each e zero, each factor equal to zero. However, I totally agree. You don't need both of those. So what are my zeros? Three positive radical two times i and negative radical 2 times i. I didn't for whatever reason, but how could I write that radical, positive radical 2i and negative radical 2i? Plus or minus. I don't know why I didn't write plus or minus there, but I didn't. Those are my zeros. And last thing I need, x-intercepts. What are my x-intercepts? X equals 3. How do we know? Because it's the only real number. It's the only real zero. Okay? If it's real, it's going to be an x-intercept. If it's imaginary, it's not going to be an x-intercept. Could you take the standard form right here and graph it? You could, and guess what? You would have a zero at 3, or you would have an x-intercept at 3. Okay? Okay, questions there. Okay, ready for example two then? Example two. Ask us to write a polynomial function of minimum degree in standard form with real coefficients whose zeros include negative 3, 4, and 2 minus i. So notice standard form using the given zeros. And notice it just says minimum degree. It should, doesn't tell me what degree this should be. Thoughts on how we do this? The question is what do we do with these zeros here so that we can write the function? Yeah, didn't you guys have something like this on the quiz? Yeah. Whereas if you have a zero of negative three, what factor does that represent? X plus three, right? If you have a factor of four, what zero does that represent? X minus four. Now, okay, let me write those two out and then we'll talk about the next one. 
So f of x equals, because we have a 0 of negative 3, it's x plus 3, which I'm guessing you guys always just think opposite sign. Am I correct on that? Yeah. Officially, what we're doing, this is important to know going forward, is that you're always subtracting. It's x minus, what was it this time? Negative 3. And what do you know about x minus negative 3? It's x plus 3. The next one is a 4. So if you do x minus 4, that is x minus 4. Okay, so the next one is 2 minus i. Thoughts on how that's going to look? Exactly, which one? I think it was the second one. Okay, so here's, okay. I'm going to write this in two ways. One way to kind of like introduce it, and this is like the reasoning behind it, and then what I'm guessing most of you guys will go to shortcut-wise. The idea behind this, remember I said it's always x minus whatever that value is, right? So I'm going to use an extra set of parentheses and say this is x minus 2 minus i. Now, writing parentheses within parentheses is annoying. It gets confusing, right? But what happens when you clear that up then? It's x minus 2 plus i because it's you're subtracting everything in that parenthesis, right? So it's minus 2 and plus i. So in other words, the shortcut is you're changing the sign on every term. So I would guess you guys are going to get in the habit of saying, just going straight there and saying x minus 2 plus i, which is fine for me. Totally fine with that. Okay. We need to talk about one more thing before we start multiplying this out. Okay, so up top, I said store it for later. Complex conjugate zeros theorem. Complex conjugate zeros theorem said, given f of x with real coefficients, if a plus bi is a zero, then a minus bi is a zero. So what's that mean here? Yeah, since 2 minus i is a 0, then the conjugate 2 plus i is a 0. So we need one more set of parentheses, yes? And notice they say minimum degree. They don't tell you that this is actually, instead of being a cubic, this is actually going to be a quartic, degree 4. So if I write it out the long way first, it's x minus the quantity 2 plus i. But x minus the quantity 2 plus i really becomes x minus 2 minus i. Okay. So because we were given a 2 minus i, we had to use 2 plus i. When I do x minus those, it means changing both signs, right? It becomes minus 2 plus i and minus 2 minus i. Question? Yes. Um, so what if it was just like 2 and then i? So we don't have any conjugate then? If they weren't, we want to throw separate. We would. Anytime there's an i, you'll have to do the conjugate thing. So only to to the i terms only. It was because it had an i in it. Because 2 minus i has an i, that's when you use the conjugate. Okay, so, ready for the fun stuff? This is what I said. It's not that, it's not, have I, ever, I don't, don't feel like I've taught anything horribly difficult today. But it's tedious, right? It's time consuming, it's tedious. Otherwise, I could easily get done with this lesson in one day. But. And if you mess one up, then you have If you mess one up, you have to be very careful. Yeah. Hans, are you going to ask? Okay, so how should I be multiplying this? What's the key that I mentioned earlier? 
Okay, x plus 3 and x minus 4 are going to go together by default because what do you know about the 2 minus i and 2 plus i one? We have to multiply those two together. Yes, it's going to look ugly because we're multiplying a 3 by 3, which means we're going to get nine terms out of it. However, there's going to be a lot of canceling. Okay, a lot of canceling, clean it up, and nine terms is going to reduce to three terms. So give it a chance. Let's go ahead and start with x plus 3 times x minus 4, though. x times x. x squared. My pen is being difficult here. x times minus 4. Negative 4x. And then you'll have a plus 3x, which is going to be a minus x. 3 times negative 4. Minus 12. So x squared minus x minus 12, okay? Okay. Now, as I do this, I'm going to take the first x in the first parenthesis, multiply it by everything in the second print in the other parenthesis. So x times x, x squared. x times minus 2, minus 2x. x times minus i, minus ix. Okay, now I'm going to repeat using the negative 2 here in the first parenthesis. Negative 2 times x, negative 2x. Negative 2 times negative 2, plus 4. Negative 2 times negative i, plus 2i. Now, repeat one more time using the i. i times x, plus ix. i times negative 2, minus 2i. And i times negative i. Negative i squared. It's intimidating because it's long, but again, I promise you, there's a lot of nice cleanup. What do you notice is going on there? Okay, minus ix plus ix cancels. Plus 2i. Minus 2i cancels. And what do you know about minus i squared? It becomes plus 1, right? Because it's minus negative 1, which really becomes plus 1. Notice what happened. All of my i's either canceled or i squared became a constant. So let me write out what we have here x squared minus x minus 12 and now in this parenthesis x squared minus 2x minus 2x is minus 4x plus 4 plus 1 is plus 5. Again if you multiply conjugates and your i's don't all cancel out or become i squared because they can be changed something's gone wrong okay don't force them to cancel out go back and look for a mistake now what? Multiply it? Okay, yeah, multiply it. Again, we're multiplying 3 by 3, which is going to give you 9 terms, but it will clean up, I promise. Not quite as nice as last time, but... Okay, I'm going to start with my first x squared here. Multiply it by the second parentheses. x squared times x squared. x to the fourth. x squared times minus 4x. Minus 4x cubed. x squared times 5. Plus 5x squared. Okay, next one, negative x. Negative x times x squared. Negative x cubed. Negative x times negative 4x. Plus 4x squared. Negative x times 5. Minus 5x. And repeating with the negative 12. Negative 12 times x squared. Negative 12x squared. Negative 12 times negative 4x. Plus 48x. Negative 12 times 5. Minus 60. Okay. x to the fourth. Minus 5x cubed. 
plus, oops, nope. 5 and 4 is 9x squared, but it's 9x squared minus 12x squared, which is going to be minus 3x squared. Right? And then keep going. Sorry, I got Jack. Negative 5x plus 48x plus 43x. So just the one constant, minus 60. Okay. Okay, guys. That's obviously our stopping point. When we come in tomorrow, we'll pick up and practice with example three and go through that. And then on the back, we're going to go into what we were doing yesterday, or lastly, with talking about like things like PRRs and synthetic division. Okay? Homework, the page 215, 2 through 36 evens. There's probably a little bit that's startable if you want to, but it won't be due until Friday. Not due tomorrow, I haven't talked at all. And I haven't talked close to all of them enough to say, eh, I'm just going to skip the last examples. No, I've still got another piece to catch up there.